Kate Mulvaney. Hello. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. So for people who, maybe the 1% of people who haven't um, read a play, seen a play, or seen you in a wonderful production, maybe um, catch people up a little bit of your backstory. My so backstory. Um, I've been a professional actor and playwright for 21 years. Uh, I'm from country Western Australia, Geraldton. Mm -hmm. I went to Curtin University and did a double major in theatre and script writing, thinking I would never get a job in theatre and script writing, and immediately got jobs in theatre and script writing. Um, so I haven't been out of work um, since I graduated uh, from university, and even while I was at university, but a lot of that um, we'll go into. Um, <laughs> it involved a lot of hard work and um, faith and love for the industry. So how much, how much has it been, um, if you look back in sort of playwriting and acting, has it been fairly even up until this point? Or? Yeah, I guess I started, I started at Curtin University um, after I moved from Geraldton. So I was a real country, country girl in the big city of Perth. And I was terrified, but managed to... The great thing about Curtin University was the first year there that you're, you're not even allowed to step on a stage. You must do backstage work. You have to ASM, you have to learn how to put up a rig, a lighting rig, you have to learn how to um, use a gel, you have to learn how to use a telescope, so on a button, um, you have to assistant direct, you name it, you had to do that before you could even put your foot in the pool of being an actor. But of course, a lot of people there wanted to be actors, but the whole sort of premise of the course was you have to work as a team and you have to know what happens backstage before you can go on stage. You know, just because you were good at high school productions doesn't mean you get to walk straight onto a stage at mm. Curtin. Um, which I thought was fantastic. It meant that we really, really learnt about each other. Um, and then in second year, I got to perform. And luckily at the same time, uh, the writing course and the theatre course at Curtin that I was doing, both of them were different ends of the campus, but it meant that we could take our scripts that we were writing with Elizabeth Jolly or Heather Nimmo down one end of the campus and take it to Heyman and go, hey, I've been working on this script, can I, can I have a slot? Mm. And more often than not, we'd get a slot at, at the Heyman and so we could try our hand at being a playwright. And so I really did start, they started hand in hand at the same time. Yeah, do, do you feel, um that write, consistently writing and, and, and looking at dialogue and looking at language has influenced your acting quite significantly and, and vice versa, being an actor has helped the playwriting. Definitely. Uh, yeah. They're like two beautiful pieces of a jigsaw puzzle that just fit mm -hmm. together so well. Um, as a, I like to say that as a writer, uh, I will never ever write a line that won't mean something to an actor. I make sure that every character uh, get something to do. There will never be a general spear holder in my plays. There's always, I make sure that even a small role has their moment because I know what it is to be an actor. And as an actor, I respect the playwright very, very much. I respect every punctuation mark. I respect why they chose that word. I would never, ever, ever say those awful words. My character wouldn't do that. That is not the part of the actor to say that. It's part of the actor to make it real. And um, yeah, there's nothing you can say that's worse to a playwright than my character wouldn't say that because that playwright's lived with that character for several years. I, um, I recently read uh, Brian Cranston's book and one, uh, a couple of lines where he stood out where he talks about, fo he's always follows the well-written word, he puts well it. Word. And I, it really resonated with me, that idea that we are much better actors when we're working with great language and great text. Mm. I wonder if you've, have you felt that through your career? And that's why we'll go into Shakespeare a bit later on, but why you followed great playwrights? Or do you, do you find that that's the thing that you always want to, you let the work, you know, you'll choose a project because it's well-written or? Definitely, yeah. always well-written. Yeah. I mean, what I said before also works in the other direction in that a playwright must always listen to an actor. And I, you know, I, I like to think that theatre companies will encourage their new playwrights to be in the room. Um, for, for, for new plays being put on so that a playwright can see that if an actor is stumbling on a line or a thought or a word that maybe there isn't something gelling in the text so it's up to the playwright to take that and tweak it. It's a team effort. It's always a team effort. 
and so we help each other along with, with text and with, um, with the story that we're trying to tell. As an actor, when I get to perform in roles such as an Arthur Miller, for example, or a Shakespeare, it's, it's delicious in the mouth. It's actually juicy and tasty and muscular and it gives you, you know, the, the, the images and the, the, the drive um, is almost, a, not a rhythmic, but there's something musical about it that makes it really, really addictive. It's good writing. Arthur Miller gives you good words to say, words like clods, you know, or there is an everlasting funeral marching around your heart. Those sorts of <laughs> lines yeah. that you love saying. <laughs> you just love saying them because yeah. they give you a beautiful image. They give the audience an image and they drive the story forward and that's good writing and therefore it makes for good acting. You don't have yeah. to add much to that, that line. It's just, it is what it is. What would you say to those actors starting out? Was there things that you learned that you'd wish you'd heard early on that, that you'd kind of those core bits of advice that maybe? Well, of course, the first thing is the most obvious and that is don't ever let anyone say you're not going to make it. That's ridiculous. Um, there are no rules to what we do. Uh, it doesn't matter if you train or if you don't train. Uh, you have to educate yourself, obviously, but you have to educate yourself. You have to read the plays. You have to go to the theatre. You have to see movies. You have to get together with your like-minded friends and have readings of each other's work in your lounge room. You know, um, be proactive. Even if you've got no money, there are ways to do these things. And if you've got an audition, you must learn about the person that you're auditioning for. You pay them that respect because they're paying you the respect of sitting and watching your performance. Um, all of those things will make you a better actor uh, and a better artist. Don't wait for the phone to ring. Just get out there and be proactive. Meet people. That's not schmoozing. That's not, you know, networking in a foyer necessarily. It's actually taking the time to have one-on-one -on -one conversations, getting in contact with people that you respect and admire and that have influenced you and tell them that. And more often than not, they will very, be very happy to say, I'd love to meet you for a coffee to talk a little bit mm -hmm. further about that. I know I do that yeah. all the time. And I love it because I get to know who's out there. I get to meet new people. I get to, they get to pick my brain and I get to pick theirs. Um, and it means that we expand the culture of our, um, and the authenticity of our um, relationship with our audience and with each other. Do you think reflecting back, how much would you say of the work that you've done has been either self-motivated or with a, a friend or a, a peer compared to maybe a more traditional route of auditioning for this role? And oh, that's such a good question because it, there's this curve factor to it, you see. You right. start off, well I started off, all friends. Mm -hmm. I would save up my Oz study to buy a pizza and some beers and invite my friends around to read my latest play. Um, I know that goes against all equity rules, but <laughs> that's what I did when I was at uni and didn't have any other way to hear my work. Um, it meant that I started to go, wow, that friend of mine who happens to be an actor is really good in that role. Mm. These are people that even now, 21 years down the track, I go, oh, my friend who 21 years ago helped me out there, there's this great role for them here um, that I know they can play because I've watched them progress just as they've watched me progress. So it started out as friends, then of course you get a little bit of um, interest from the industry and you start getting the auditions and then you reach a certain point where you might not need to audition anymore and it starts to become more about um, the friend friendships and relationships that you nurture yourself within yeah. the industry. I know that as a playwright, um, if I see a young actor that's just graduated or in their graduation process or hasn't been anywhere to graduate from but happens to be appearing on the old fit stage or in some tiny dark space that I've never heard of and I go, oh, they're fantastic, then I will always put their name on an audition list, yeah. no matter what the company, and go, please see this person because I think they're amazing. And that's, you know, that's part of the education of getting out there, seeing people, getting to know people, um, keeping a finger on the pulse. And I guess then is that largely the same for playwriting, kind of 
fueling up on all that creativity and reading more and watching more and yeah. just, just doing it a lot. Yeah, you got to keep up with the times. You know, as much as I love Arthur Miller, mm. there are new Millers out there that mm. uh, aren't white males. You know, they, they are, um, especially in Australia, we at the moment have the most extraordinary group of writers coming through, directors, um, designers that are, um, have always been there, but it's just just now their their voice is finally shining through, and yeah, they're the people I go and see. Yeah. They're the people that inspire me the most. Are you generally um, optimistic or excited by the Australian industry? Yeah, of course. There's the occasional deflation, <laughs> without getting too political. But um, I think I'm a real old hippie in those terms and I just think that um, the more that we care for each other and that we listen to each other um, the the better our industry will get we have to nurture all of the voices in our industry and um, keep an eye out for each other because if we can't support ourselves then no one's going to support us because we don't get a lot of support from anyone else so we must must take care of each other have a lot of self-love and um, and respect so it was so interesting before you saying um, how Shakespeare and, uh, and a you know, brand new Aussie work is kind of the same thing in a way in terms of, do, do you feel that's uh, the same in your process to these sort of roles? Does your process change? And I guess with mediums as well, with TV and film? Or, no. No, always the same? No, I, I don't have a Shakespearean method of, a, a temp of going to a role. Um, and I don't have an Australian or, or you know, traditional play kind of method of going to a role. I'd, I'd work very much from instinct and gut. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I'd put myself in their shoes, but I also put themselves in my shoes. I go, what have we got that matches? Um, where have I been in my life that's similar to that? Um, but more than that, I go on a kind of a psychological level of isn't that interesting that you know, that, that character does that at that moment after here. I, I pull the text apart and look for, I call it breadcrumbs. I look for the breadcrumbs that lead to the gingerbread house. Um, a good play and a good actor will never reveal the gingerbread house straight away. A good actor and a good playwright will um, drop or pick up the breadcrumbs and so will the audience and it makes for a really um, interesting and fascinating and scary and delightful trip through the forest before you reach, you know, the big reveal of, of whatever the, the narrative climax is. And does that manifest in a lot of kind of written work, of thinking about things and keeping notes or just sort of just letting it? Sort just of letting it. Do your research, do your research, do your research, then let it go mm. and make it yours. I don't ever watch anyone else's Shakespearean performances. Um, I, I just, I, I, I only rely on my own research and the people around me. Um, the conversations that I'll have with, say, another actor um, that's playing opposite me, if we have a kind of intense scene, it's, it's making it jigsaw together in the right way mm. from their experience, from my experience, but also making it completely right and real for our audience. I have a big, uh, as a writer, my motto is make them laugh, then break their hearts, then make them laugh again. And I think that if you can do that um, for an audience, that if you make them laugh, they will go, they fall in love with you, they go with you, and then you can bust them. <laughs> and then you go, no, I'm so yeah. sorry about that, come in, laugh again, and then bust them, and that makes for it. That's my rule as a playwright. You know, it sounds like all the projects that you've picked have been um, I'm not putting words in your mouth here, but, but you, have you followed always, um, followed your gut and followed people that excite you and work, or have you, have you planned it out in any sense in terms of going, I know that would be a great uh, career move, or has there been any, any... Yeah, if anything, I've kind of bucked the system a little bit. I never wanted to be famous, and I think there's a, that's a really important question to ask yourself as an actor, is do you want to be a famous person? Or do you want to be an artist? Or do you want to be, try to be both? It's very different. I never wanted fame or recognition. I just wanted to act. I just wanted to write. And I, I 
you always get that thing when you're an actor, I still get it. Um, no matter how much success I have, there will always be those people that go, well, what have you done? <laughs> you know? And I find that so exhausting because I go, that, that seems to hint at me having not done my job, but really it's them saying, I don't recognise you or I don't, it's them saying, I don't go to the theatre is basically what it really means. Um, so in a way, I've deliberately stayed away from anything that was um, going to make me a household name. You know, as an actor, I've obviously been for and gotten jobs that were big and exciting and that my mum was really thrilled for me to get, but I, I turned a lot of them That's down. That's the good gauge, isn't it? The mum's <laughs> excitement level. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I turned down home in a way once. She was not <laughs> happy. Um, but I... I just, I, I just always kept checking into what I wanted, and I still do, to try and cut through the white noise of fame mm. and expectations um, that, that society seems to have if you say you are an actor. Uh, and, I, and instead I just stayed true to myself, and that was I wanted to write plays. I wanted to perform on stage. Um, if I do film and TV, I, I, I still do that but I really pick and choose those roles when, they're, when they become available. That said, when I first started out, I said yes to everything, mm. everything, um, because everything that was being offered to me was stage and most of it was independent theatre. I started out very much in the independent sector and still return to it as much as I can. And um, I learnt everything in those, you know, on those stages and under those, the tutelages of people like Ian Sinclair. Marion Potts, who were, you know, at that stage in that area as well. Um, so that I think is a good rule to a point, and then you have to learn to start saying no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't be like me and say yes to everything for, for a long. I got I did that much longer than I needed to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I think it's a good one because I especially think uh, in terms of drama school graduates or people who've. Um, I definitely feel among my peers there is some sentiment that you know you go to a good drama school um, maybe you have a good agent uh, and I've now been out for five years and seen a lot of people who just haven't worked and I think it's because uh, there was some expectation or some maybe feeling of entitlement and I if people ask me I think my recommendation is always to definitely have a period of saying yes and, and especially saying yes to great indie shows and things yeah. like that. Yeah also just to keep your energy keep your so Keep your muscle memory, mm -hmm. keep yourself fit, keep your, 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 your body is your instrument and if you're not exercising that body on a stage or, um, God, even just get up and perform in your living room, just get it, just get it, do it, do it, do it because otherwise you get flabby. <laughs> um, not just flabby of body but flabby of soul and spirit. Um, and. There's no room for bitterness in this industry. Mm. You will meet bitter people and you will meet um, jaded people that you kind of go, you should let it go. Like, let it go if it's got to that. You, you've got to keep up the self-love. Yeah, on that, how do you think, yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, self-love and, and sort of the way you, you, you frame looking at the industry, but is there other ways that you've found to get through those times where you feel deflated or you feel you're not moving forward or... Yeah, and, and this is actually a new revelation for me. Um, I was getting overworked, really overworked because of that terrible um, rule that I'd given myself years ago, which was say yes to everything. Um, luckily, the things I was getting offered were, I feel so lucky um, that they were the right projects for me. Some of them weren't, but mostly they were. I have learnt to take time out from my industry. I've learnt to um, spend time with my friends where we don't talk. And obviously a lot of my friends are actors, mm -hmm. but I just love it when we don't talk work, where we just muck around and we'll go to the beach or we'll go for a holiday away. I spend time with my cats <laughs> and my family. Um, I find I do other work. I, I work for a couple of charities, a um, couple of um, organisations that I can put all of my energy into that and get an idea of what the real world is really like and it's not about a Shakespearean monologue and how well that's delivered. There's a lot more important things out there than 
what we do. As much as we, we, are, we are in a very important industry, we provide entertainment, life, love and storytelling, which is the most ancient of arts. But at the same time, we need to keep an eye on the real world as well. The real world needs artists in other ways. Um, so I, I tend to put my focus on that as well. If you're an actor right now, wherever you're at in your career, feeling stuck, mm. uh, I think stuck's the, the biggest feeling I feel. I think a lot of actors I know feel, especially younger actors go, what, what do I do? Yeah. Everyone's got the passion, but no one feels they know, know what to do. Mm. Um, I guess, yeah, if, if you were in that position 20 years ago, or you know, if you were talking to a young actor, what that advice would be? Whenever I was stuck as a young actor, I reached out to my elder actors. I reached out to people that have also been stuck. Um, people that have lived a hell of a lot longer than me, been in a hell of a lot more productions and, and work than me, and also lived a life much more perhaps complicated to mine. Um, and their advice to this day keeps me going, I still call them. I mean, I know that I'm an elder to some actors. I still call the elders around me, my own, my own personal elders that have been in the arts for a long time to say, I feel stuck or I can't breathe or how do I get through this or will you come and read my play for me? And they do. They've, they've been around and they will help you. And I will help you if you so require. Um, that's, that's what we should all be here for.